This is Dylan FM, the podcast that goes deep into the work and world of Bob Dylan. If you love Dylan, you're in the right place with your host, Craig Danielov. In October of 1963, a few days before the final recording session for the times they are changing, Bob Dylan took the stage at Carnegie Hall. His latest album was Freewheelin'. It was only seven months old at the time, but Bob only played three songs from that record in the 15-song set that night. He had too many new ones. One of the songs he played that night, which he had recorded two days earlier but would ultimately be left off of the times they are changing, was Lay Down Your Weary Tune. Lay down your weary tune, lay down. Lay down this song you strum. Only Dylan tape traders and collectors would hear that song for the next 20 years but one of the people who managed to get his hands on an early bootleg copy was Michael Gray. As Gray wrote Song and Dance Man, the book we've been walking through, he had a lot of Dylan to discuss and analyze. There were already 12 released records, hundreds of songs, and as Gray himself put it, Dylan had changed the course of popular music. Yet out of a decade of songwriting and performing and world-changing, there was one song that seemed to demand special attention. Gray devotes chapter 8 in Song and Dance Man to lay down your weary tune. And in this episode, we talk about why and dig into the things Gray found special about it and look at what other early Dylan writers said about it. To read the full chapter we're discussing, pick up a copy of Song and Dance Man Volume 1. It's available in paperback and on Kindle at Amazon. The discussions in this podcast series highlight points in the book and expand on it in some cases. But trust me, we're barely scratching the surface. If you love Dylan, you'll want to read the full book. The excerpts you'll hear in this chapter were read by Jim Salvucci, who hosts the Dylan Taunts podcast, which is also here on the FM Podcast Network. On that show, Jim and a group of other scholars and researchers talk about Dylan in both interesting interviews and some great roundtable discussions of things like the Fragments box set, the philosophy of modern song, and the recent World of Bob Dylan conference. You can subscribe to the Dylan Taunts in your favorite podcast app. My thanks to Jim for helping us out with the excerpts for this chapter. If you're hearing this, you're listening to our public feed. There's an extended version of this episode, they're usually at least twice as long, available for FM Plus and premium subscribers. You can subscribe right now in Apple Podcasts or at fmpods.com. You'll get the extended versions and bonus episodes of not only this show, but all the shows in the FM Podcast Network, which includes Pod Dylan, The Dylan Taunts, and more. We have no ads in these episodes, and our subscribers and members make this show possible. If you can join us, you'll get a lot, and your support will be appreciated. Now, here's our talk with Michael Gray about the song Lay Down Your Weary Tune. Hi, Michael. Welcome back. Thank you. So we've got a short, focused chapter this time. Tell me to start um, why this song was selected for the spotlight for treatment in this way. Well, uh, basically because it was unlike anything else, either side of it, in his entire canon. I mean, it just seemed to me, whoa. I mean, I don't know how now I heard it so early on, because certainly it had not been officially released until many, many years after I wrote this chapter. Um, but somehow I heard heard it on some bootleg. It just made me all the more determined to uh, to highlight this chapter. And because nobody had heard it officially, I had to use the whole lyric. And it it just didn't fit in with any other particular chapter, you know. I mean, at the time, I wasn't uh, I wasn't writing it album by album as it as it tended to be later in the process. I mean, this chapter comes from the very first edition, so I was writing it at the beginning of the nineteen seventies, and um, you know, 
there was no way that uh, it seemed to fit in with any other track. I mean, now I know that it was um, a times they are a changing outtake. And actually, um, you know, I do sometimes these these talks with audio and footage, Bob Dylan's greatest rejected album tracks. Um, uh, I have one more to do this year in Hebden Bridge in North York, in West Yorkshire. Uh, at the end of October, and um, it's one of the tracks I use as one of his great rejected album tracks. I just think it's a standout piece of writing, and um, and the performance is okay. You know, the performance is fine. It's not um, it's not as impassioned, or on the other hand, as kind of uh, dispassionate as 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 might be even more appropriate to it, given that that it's abolishing I on the whole. Uh, and, and, you know, it's a pantheistic vision. That is to say, not that God is everywhere, but that everything is God. You know, every rock, every mountain, every fountain, every slug is God, <laughs> you know. Um, and that's that's well. This brings us into the whole discussion of of uh, of why the song is is so different. Well, here's our first excerpt. Uh, something you say about the song and his performance in this chapter. Dylan's voice on this track is as expressive as ever of distilled, unspecified experience and a fine sensibility. Totally engaged. Handled by anyone else, it would not be the same song, which also means that the words of the song have a complexity that demands such a voice as Dylan's. For the whole song, words, music, and performance are all central. Here's how the song sounded that night at Carnegie Hall. Struck by the sounds before the sun I knew the night had gone The morning breeze like a bugle blew Against the drums of dawn Lay down your weary tune Lay down Lay down the song you strum and rest yourself neath the strength of strings No voice can hope to hum The ocean wild like an organ played The seaweeds wove its strands the crashing waves like cymbals clashed Against the rocks and the sands I like the fact that he says, you know, that, it, uh, that it's based on some Scottish folk song melody that he heard at Joan Byers' house one time. And he couldn't remember what it was, uh, and he used it. Well, I don't know whether that's true or not, but it's uh, it's a striking melody. It's nice. It's, but it's uh, you know, it was really the words that got me. The um, it's it's a kind of poetic writing that that seemed unique. You know, the last of leaves fell from the trees and clung to a new love's breast i.e. the ground. I mean, that's that's real poet writing, isn't it? That's that's not um, that's not folk song. It's not rock song. It's um, it's it's the way that you could see it on the page as a poet's work from more or less any time, at least from the nineteenth century onwards, because um, before that. As I've as I've mentioned before, I think on one of these podcasts of ours, these many podcasts of ours, um, it's uh, 
before before the romantic poets, nobody liked mountains and stuff. They thought they were rubble. They thought, they're described as rubble before uh, before Wordsworth and Coleridge said mountains are great. To this end of how different it is, uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about some uh, some of what John Baldy talked about, and he had this observation about this song. The song does mark the development of poetic thought in a way that a hard rain's going to fall had done before it. I can see what he means. He, um, this is from his book, The Chameleon Poet, which is published by Root, British publishing house, that also published my um, outtakes on Bob Dylan in 2021, which is still available, by the way. I can see what he means because... You know, uh, Hard Rain's Gonna Fall came out of nowhere with all these with all these extraordinary visual images. Certainly it wasn't like any of his other early songs. And it was very long and, and it was kind of rhapsodic, if you like. It was visionary. It was just this kind of cacophony of visions seen and heard and... And so to that extent, this is like it in that it's it's completely different and it's visionary and it's very it's very poetic in a in a kind of more traditionally poetic way. Um but I don't think the two songs are are strikingly alike in um in the world they represent. I think um you know, for example, the the Hard Rain's Going to Fall is locked into its folk roots, the whole structure of it, and the whole way that um, the way that images emerge from it. Whereas this is uh, this has one kind of youth, unity that there's, there's no equivalent of in Hard Rain, I don't think. And that unity is that all these sounds and natural world aspects that that he brings into lay down your weary tune they are all they are all described as if parts of an orchestra you know everything sounds like a banjo or or like an orchestra in some way or or you know. and in that sense it's um it's very uh, cohesive you know he 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 uses this analogy of of the natural world being one great big orchestra. He uses that all through the song. Let's hear a few more verses of that metaphor, this time from Billy Bragg covering the song for Amnesty International. I stood unwound beneath the sky The clouds unbound by lords The crying like a trumpet sang and as for your word pulls me down you'll be reach to lay down lay down the song you strum and rest yourself neath the strength of streams heard the Goldberg piece and he just right, he kind of dismisses early Dylan and you you point out you you quote him in the book but you like certain parts of what he's done and and maybe less others but reading his full original article which for everyone's benefit is in a, a book you can get called the early years of Ret- Bob Dylan retrospective edited by Craig McGregor Craig McGregor was an Australian and he and he pioneered uh, putting a bunch of articles about Dylan into a collection into a book. And one of them is this Stephen Goldberg piece. It's a long time since I looked at it, but uh, but I remember, you know, my own use of it uh, as. Uh, and yes, he uh, he's not interested in early Bob Dylan's work because early Bob Dylan is um, is interested in the sort of political world, uh, into the every in the everyday world, the mundane world that we all spend most of our time plowing through. And Goldberg is interested in this song because uh, he's interested in another world, uh, a kind of mystic, mystical world. He's not a sort of straightforward 
Christian believer. He's not a Buddhist or or or, or anything like that, but he's he's a mystic. He he believes that there's some kind of great throbbing thing that um that binds us all to the universe. So the nearest thing he gets to a traditional kind of view is of pantheism, which, as I say, is this thing that God is in everything. God is everything. And and this is a romantic poet's uh, viewpoint too. God is in every, every daffodil for Wordsworth and so on. But one of the points I make in this, in this chapter is that... Um, is that Dylan is not a natural mystic, you know. You don't you don't write all that early political stuff and hustle your way through to New York and do all this do all this performing in Greenwich Village and so on. You don't do all that because you are glowing with mysticism. You do it because you're a young punk who wants to be successful. Uh, uh, and who has ambition on a scale that very few of us suspected at the time, and which he probably suspected very strongly about himself all along. And so, yeah, Dylan is not uh, a natural mystic, and that's part of... uh, And so when I talk about... um, You know, I quote Goldberg because uh, he has... He has uh, a convenient way of explaining what he's on about. Isn't it amazingly astute of Goldberg to point it out as signaling some change? A song more strikingly different from Dylan's earlier output would be impossible to imagine. All the same, it's a song that has received less attention than almost any other in the whole of Dylan's repertoire, so that it's of interest that Goldberg should focus on it at all. And no other song could enforce for me so strong a sense of the acid mystic equation's validity. Goldberg cites it in terms of mysticism. I would cite it as Dylan's first acid song, the first concentrated attempt to give a hint of the unfiltered world and a supremely successful creation. Goldberg refers elsewhere in his article to Dylan's having heard the universal melody. Nothing could better substantiate the spirit of such a claim than lay down your weary tune, one of the very greatest and most haunting creations in our language. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm immediately, from my own experience at that point of, uh, of, of Bob Dylan and what he did in the world, my immediate thought was, well, um, if he's not a natural mystic, then where... How does he arrive at this, at this, at being attuned to this level of mysticism, which the song appears to evince? And how is it most likely that he would get there? Drugs. <laughs> well, well, we'll get to that in a minute. But okay. you hit on exactly the the point I wanted to make about Goldberg, which is it feels to me like something Bob has to put up with a lot. He had something he wanted to find or a story he wanted to tell, and he needed to find something in Dylan's work that he could reverse engineer and say, Dot, but Bob did this for this reason. I like the, I like the reverse engineering <laughs> way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he has an agenda, and he uh, this is the Bob he fixes on because this is the one that, that fits his agenda well fine um but i mean i think i think uh you know when we're talking about this particular period in bob's life this is where he is um as well as being you know the very ambitious young guy that i was characterizing him as a, a little while back uh, he's also a very open to different experience and different people's influences. You know, he's influenced by so many people. Uh, You know, you've only got to see the way that Woody Guthrie's work grabbed him very early on to see that. And uh, he's he's influenced by Dave Van Ronk in in Greenwich Village. He's influenced by finding the, the French symbolist poets. He's influenced, he's open. To he's he you know he's always part of his bravery I think 
is is that he has never been determined not to look beyond what's directly in front of him. He's always been prepared to look at stuff coming in from the sides, but without being derailed by it, you know. I mean, and when we're talking about his use of drugs, you know, I mean, most people, most people, if they find acid, let's say, and they have um, a really profound, they feel they have a really profound experience under its influence, then, you know, they're likely to go down that rabbit hole. Bob never does, but he's open to it. Um, I think that's a hugely important Bob Dylan <laughs> observation, actually. It, it, we all think of how diverse the music is, how diverse everything is, even within periods, as we've seen looking through the early albums. Uh, and we know that's unique, but I think you just kind of described it in a way that allows us to think about it. Um, you know, there would have been people on that scene as early as 63, 64. There would have been people in the, in the world that he was moving within who, uh, who did talk to him about things like mysticism and God and, uh, and you know, a higher level of consciousness than the political. I'm sure he was aware by then that, uh, that you know, that one way of seeing the world was that there is a higher level of consciousness than bickering about senators and congressmen and, and, and all that stuff and protesting about war and so on. I think I think there has to have been a side of Bob that was interested right from the beginning. I mean, actually, you know, when he talks about the effect of being from Minnesota and from Hibbing, from, from that iron ore country, he talks about vibes from the ground and, uh, you know, the, the kind of, uh, he talks in a semi-mystical way sometimes but about this, that early upbringing. This even is kind though, of... Even though on a rational level, you know, he lives in a middle-class house with middle-class parents. His father has a middle-class job and, uh, you know, he goes to a, an exceptionally good school. But at the same time, he talks about the iron in the ground having an effect on people and so on. But this is kind of my point in the, in the sense that he can respond to nature. He can appreciate the, the significance of things in the world without it being a leap to mysticism or a nod to mysticism. And all I'm saying, again, for the purpose of sort of stratifying this, is that Bob could you know, he realizes there's beauty and deep natural beauty in all of these things. He obviously also realizes that something happens with music that is unlike other things, that music also has this power. He draws the analogy, writes the song, stop. And, I, and I'm, I'm kind of thinking about this the way people, a lot of people listen, because a lot of people with mysticism and these, the fact that that's God is in everything would never occur to them. Um, and it possible it didn't even occur to Bob in that kind of specific sense it was just a song okay. for whatever yeah. reason let's go to an excerpt from the book in this one you talk about this relationship between the natural world and music and by its very impingement it urges the felicity of dylan's analogies between nature's effects and the sounds of musical instruments as it flows through each line with a graceful and liquid precision the melody nurtures and sustains us and an awareness of... To hear the rest of this discussion, please become an FM Plus or Premium subscriber. You'll get all of our extended episodes and all of those plus bonus episodes from everyone on the FM Podcast Network. You can subscribe right in Apple Podcasts or at fmpods.com. Did you enjoy this show? then please rate this podcast and leave a review. It really helps. Also, sign up for 7 Days, our free weekly newsletter that puts all the top Bob Dylan news and links into your inbox every Sunday. Use the link in the show notes. Thanks for listening. <laughs>